morning, everybody. I ask this every lecture. I'm hoping today will be the day. Besides this class, do you have any midterms? I'm seeing some no's, so it's getting better. Any midterms this week besides, of course, mine? Yes? All right, so what, what are you guys burdened with this week? Psych? <laughs> I got a story about psych. So uh, I'm not sure, because they change the program all the time, but when I took first year, we had an elective. Did you guys have an elective in first year? No. no. Yeah, so right now there's no elective in first year either, but when I took it, I had my first year elective. Now in high school, I did AP. You guys remember AP, all that stuff? I'm thinking, wow, I'm going to be so prepared. <laughs> that didn't really work. Now, I was always jealous of the science kids because if you took math AP, science, no, I guess it's not science AP, physics, chem, you got credits and you didn't have to do that first year course. For me, I did world history and I got a, a four. I didn't get a perfect score, I got four and it's, it's out of five and they said, okay, we can give you credit for your first year elective. They said, we can give you a B plus. You got four out of five, we can give you a B plus. And this was before I ever been to university. So I said, no way. <laughs> I'm going to go to that class. I'm going to get an A. I'm not going to settle for a B plus. I got a C. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's my story with psych. It, it would have helped if I went to class, but it was 8 a.m. 8 a.m. classes are hard. It's hard for me to come here, <laughs> let alone to a, a class where I just sit there. I feel bad for you guys. I sat in on a lecture. And just sitting around for an hour and a half, it's hard. So thank you guys for coming to this class. I appreciate it. I know, I know it's hard. I never went to this class because it was eight, at 8 a.m. when I took it. It's, it's too hard. So I do have good news for you guys. Well, actually, I got a lot of good news. First good news is reading week is almost here. It's exciting. All right? You guys can probably all use it. I know I can use it. It's been a, a long semester so far, but at the same time, it's also been quick, which is unbelievable. Today is lecture 15, 15. And as I said, we're only testing on 20 lectures. So as of today, we're three quarters done the course. Is that crazy? After today, we basically have three topics. Strain energy, which we've already talked about quite a bit. It's the area under the stress strain curve. We have two lectures on virtual work. You guys remember virtual work from 372? We're going to derive it. Ooh. <laughs> and then the last one is the Rayleigh-Ritz method. So basically, again, we're talking about these approximation methods. Virtual work method is an approximation method, and so is Rayleigh-Ritz. Virtual work will follow the same derivation that we used in 372 and stuff like that, while the Rayleigh-Ritz method is based on strain energy. So the rest of the course is going to come very fast. Now, before we begin today's lecture, which is more good news, it should be a quick lecture. It should be nice and simple, right? That's good, right before reading week. We're just going to do a quick recap of what we did last lecture. And I'm going to touch upon something I got a question about, which I think is very important for you guys. So last lecture, what we focused on was beams under just uh, <laughs> lateral load if I can draw this. So if we had just a simply supported beam and it's under some distributed load, let's say like this, all we did last lecture was we used Euler-Bernoulli beam assumptions to derive the following differential equation where we have, I kind of forget it, <laughs> EI times the fourth derivative of deflection over D, I guess X, it could be whatever you want, is equal to the distributed load that you put on the beam. W, it could be Q, it could be whatever. Today, what we are going to do is we are going to derive the differential equation of a beam under axial load. So let's say that we have a beam like this, and I have some sort of axial load we're going to derive this differential equation. So that's all we're doing here is we're taking these very common civil applications and we're deriving their differential equations. The reason why we're doing this is because, as we said last lecture, if I know this differential equation, 
right here, I can solve for displacement. And once I have displacement, I can solve for strain, stresses, and I can even determine if the beam fails or not based on Tresca or von Mises yield criteria. So that's all we're trying to do. We're trying to get the displacement functions of these very common civil applications. So we talked about beams under kind of a distributed load or beams under bending. And now we're going to talk about beams under axial load. Now, what is a beam under axial load at, for structural engineers? What would you guys call that? If we have a beam and we have an axial load on it, because I know when we look at this picture right here, it doesn't really make too much sense when we would have this exact scenario. But think of 374. When do you see a beam under axial load? Tension members, yeah, that's a good one. Stresses. No, no one? <laughs> Columns. We call them beams, but it's essentially a column. So we're going to drive that. Now, the one thing that you're going to have to keep in mind in this course is that we're separating the two. We have a differential equation for beams under a distributed load. We are going to have a differential equation for a beam under axial load, but we will not have a differential equation for a beam under both. There is a differential equation for it. It just starts to get more and more complex. So this is where we kind of cut it off. Question for everyone in 374. Have you dealt with a beam that has both a distributed load, case one, as well as an axial load? What are you guys having? I'm not sure how they do the course. We have not. We have not. Do you think that they exist? Yeah. What do you guys think? Do you think it's common? Do you think that this column here in this lecture room has any sort of lateral load? What do you guys think? It's hard to picture. Because if we look inside, is there any wind blowing on this column? No. Is there anyone pushing it? No. So the question becomes, okay, Clayton, if you're saying it's very common, how, how does that occur? It occurs in connections. What you will see is in order to have a stiff connection, we want it fixed. So let's say that this column is fixed to the roof slab, fixed. If we have a fixed connection, do we have a moment at the top of the column? And will that moment cause the column to bend? Yes. So we don't have it in this exact scenario, realistically. We, we do in some cases, but mostly what you'll see is you'll have a column and it'll have a moment applied at the top. That's what we would call a beam column. So that's kind of a little recap of what we're doing. And then I'm going to discuss something else just to really refresh your memory. And that is the concept of plane stress and plane strain. When do we use them? Question for you guys, plane strain. What am I assuming in terms of into the page? Can it expand under plane strain? No. Can it expand into the page under plain stress? So that's kind of the key assumption here. So let's say that I am a structural engineer and I want to design an Amazon warehouse wall. I'm using that as an example because as you guys have seen, those walls are crazy long. You guys ever see that Amazon place outside of Edmonton? Crazy big facility. And I want to design one of these walls. Now the thickness of these walls is usually around 200 millimeters, not too big. But the actual span of these walls is huge. Let's just say 30 meters. Depending on how I want to model this in two dimensions will depend on if I pick plane stress or plane strain. If I were to model this for shear, so let's say that I was loading this like this under an earthquake, we had a load P, and I'm modeling the entire length of the wall. So I'm gonna come down here, and this is my entire wall. What would you guys use for this scenario? What do you think? If I were to model the entire length of the wall, 
remember that in-plane thickness, even though it's not accounted for in the 2D model, remember it's only 200 millimeters. What would you guys pick? Plane stress or plane strain? Let's ask the simple question. Can this, if I were to take this wall, can it theoretically move into the page? If I were to compress the wall, do the effects of Poisson's ratio with the wall expand into the page? Am I preventing that wall from expanding into the page? No, I'm not preventing any sort of expansion. So for this particular case, we can say that this could be plain stress because there is nothing behind the wall stopping it from actually expanding into that thickness. Now, if I were to go to this wall and say, okay, this is for shear, but if I want to analyze bending moment, so let's say that this is an outdoor wall and it has wind applied to it, and I want to analyze this cross section right here. So I go down to my 2D model and I say, okay, this is my wall now. Remember, this is now 200. And now that's the height of the wall. If I were to look at this little piece in the wall, can this expand into the page? If I were to look at it from this perspective. Actually, let's just go to a wall. If I were to look at this slice right here, can this slice expand laterally? This slice? No. The reason why? Well, there's a wall over here that prevents it. If I want to expand the wall, I have to expand the whole thing. So if I'm looking at just a little piece of the wall, it kind of has boundary conditions on both sides that would prevent it. So in this case, it would be plain strain, or plain, yeah, plain strain. It's one of those things that you don't really have to know it, but it's fun to do an example. Is there any questions about this? No? Perfect. Just again, it's just a little fun little ex exercise. So again, today we're going to solve the differential equation for this beam. Quick question for you guys though. Have you guys dealt with beams under an axial load in your assignment? Not this current assignment, assignment seven, but before. Were you given a beam and asked to find the stress distribution throughout the beam? Yes, I got a lot of questions about it. <laughs> so you definitely did. Well, we're going to talk about that today. And as we can see, it's only four slides. It's pretty nice, which is great. It's just before reading week, nice easy lecture. Everybody's happy. So beams under axial load. I would like to have put this kind of in the same theory as Euler Bernoulli beams, because as we're going to see, they have the exact same assumptions. Exact same assumptions. The only problem is, is that lecture then begin, becomes a little bit too long, so we separate it into two. Beams under axial load. Like Euler Bernoulli beams, we are going to derive the differential equation based on plain beam assumptions. What it means by plain beam assumptions is mainly this. Oops. We are going to assume plain sections remain plain. That's kind of the key one here. And again, if you guys are saying, Clayton, an assumption, do we actually do that in reality? Yes. If you go to any design class, wood, timber, concrete, whatever, and you were to analyze a cross section, every code book, Canada, America, Eurocode, they all assume this. It's a very valid assumption under small deformations which is going to be the second one that we have, small deformations. And then the last one is that our beam is going to be linear elastic and Poisson effects can be ignored. So now what we are going to do to derive it is we are going to look at the exact same kind of scenario we did for Euler Bernoulli beams. We are going to take a beam and we are going to analyze how a point moves along this beam. So we are going to look at the point at the end. It's the one I think is the easiest. And currently, in its undeformed configuration, it has a distance x1 and it has a height x2. So this is the initial point. Now, if I were to take this beam and I were to stretch it, it's going to go something like this. So notice here that the, the distance between these two lines is now increased. 
So there is going to be some stress and some strain in that direction. But here's the trick. If this is plain sections remain plain, which basically means that this cross section does not deform vertically, does this point change with respect to X2? Does the vertical location of this point change? If my cross section has to stay the exact same as over here, does this point change vertically? What do you guys think? No. So that's the nice thing. We know we moved it a distance U1, but this height over here, it still stays X1. Again, this is coming from that plane sections remain plane. This cross section cannot deform. So that's what's nice. Now, if we were to look at the position functions, it's simple. X2 did not change, so it's still X2. X3, which is into the page, did not change, so it's X3. And if we were to look at the new position of this point, well, it went from X1, and then we just added U1. Nice and simple. If this is our position function, is our displacement function going to look very nice? What do you guys think? Is my displacement function going to look very nice if this is my position function? The answer is yes. Because to get a displacement function, I just take X and I subtract big X. So if I'm subtracting X1, X2, and X3 from these components, this is my displacement function. It's just U1, 0, and 0. Now, if my displacement function is very nice, which it is, do you think the strain is going to be very nice as well? Yes. If I were to find my strain tensor, we will see that the strain tensor only has one component, which is epsilon 1, 1. There is no shearing occurring. There is no strain in the vertical direction. There is just a strain in the horizontal direction. And that strain is just the first derivative of our displacement function. That's it. If I want the strain in one of these beams, just under axial load, it's just going to be the derivative of my displacement function. How nice is that? It's going to come and play a big role later on. So now what we are going to do is we're going to say, okay, now that we have all the background, let's go into the differential equation. So if we were to take equilibrium about this object, what we can do, just like we've done so many times, is we are going to take a little slice, and it's going to be infinitesimal. Again, very thin little slice dx. On the left-hand side, we have sigma 1, 1. And on the right-hand side, we have sigma 1, 1 plus the change in sigma 1, 1 over this line dx. We have a distributed load p. And then, of course, we have to define the area on both sides. This is where the class starts getting fun. If I didn't give you this lecture slide, I mean, I were to ask you guys right now, could you guys give me this free body diagram? If I gave you no information and I asked you to analyze this beam, do you think that you could have derived that based on what you know? No? We've done this many times. It is my hope that you guys can do this. Again, one of the things that I just said is we are not considering the case where we have beam columns, bending and axial load. But if you guys know this procedure because it applies to every single thing in existence, you guys could derive the beam column equation. It's actually pretty simple to do it. So this is going to be our scenario and all we're going to do is make sure that we have force equilibrium. So of course to get force, it takes stress and then multiply it by area. And this is the equation that we get. I'm hoping this looks familiar because this is the exact same equation that we had in our lab, exactly the same. So you say, okay, this isn't too bad. If it's static, it must be equal to zero. And the only thing to note is that P is our total distributed force. So it'd be our distributed load Q plus our self weight rho G A. That's one distinction we have to make. So what we are going to do is we are now going to try and solve for some of the components. But before we do that, there's going to be some simplification. If we expand our equation, we get this right here. And do these two terms cancel out? What do you guys think? Can I just cancel out those terms? Yes. I say bye-bye to those. 
and I get the following equation. And you guys just told me, Clayton, I couldn't derive this. So let me just ask you, what would my next step be? What would be my next step? What do you guys think? Divide them by dx. And I know all you guys are thinking it. You guys are just too scared to say it. You guys can derive this. You guys know the steps. If we look at this, we see that every single term has a dx1. So we can factor that out. And if I were to divide both sides by dx, I can get rid of dx. Zero divided by dx will still give me zero. So that goes away. What's my next step? What other things can I do to this equation to make it nicer? <coughs> Take the limit. See? You guys busting my balls saying you guys don't know how to do this? You guys know exactly how to do this. We still have one dx term, but we know that if our slice is very thin and we take the limit, that goes away. So this is our equation. Now again, P is the total distributed load. But my question for you guys, is this the equation you guys did for that assignment when you found the stress? Yes. So if you want the stress distribution, you can solve it. But we talked about it earlier at the beginning of the lecture. I'm not interested in stress right now. What am I interested in? What am I trying to solve for? What do you guys think? This is a short lecture, so I have like 40 minutes to work with. I don't mind waiting. What do you think we're trying to solve for? In the last lecture, Euler Bernoulli beams. Why did we want that differential equation? What did it give us? That was the key to solving everything. I heard it whispered, displacement. Is this a function of displacement? No. So we're going to take what we did before and we are going to move it forward. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reverse product rule it. Basically, if you guys remember from calculus, if I have two functions and I want the derivative and they're multiplied together, I can separate them out into the following format. So that's product rule. But if I realize it over here, I can shift it to this equation right here. And this is where all the fun is going to start happening. We are going to take that equation and we are going to utilize the following relationship. Sigma 1, 1, which appears here, is equal to E and epsilon 1, 1. Clayton, where'd you get that? Well, we looked at the beam. If I have a beam and I just put axial load, is this just uniaxial tension? Yes, it's just uniaxial tension. So I have the following relationship. So if I look at my beam here, I have sigma 1, 1. I can now replace it with E times epsilon 1, 1. Question for you guys again. Very first slide. Did we find the strain tensor for these beams? So do we know what epsilon 1, 1 is? Yes. Who remembers? Who remembers? I know it's hard. It's been, what, four minutes? Exactly. This is just going to be the derivative of displacement with respect to x. So now I can take this term here, epsilon 1, 1, and I'm going to modify it accordingly. Now let's look at this equation. I wanted displacement. Do I have a displacement term in this equation? Do I have a displacement term? Yes, u1 is my displacement. Let's look at the other terms to make sure we can solve this. Elastic modulus. As a designer, will you know the elastic modulus of something? Yes. Area. Cross-sectional area. As a designer, will you know or pick the cross-sectional area? Yes. P, the load placed on the beam. Again, as a designer, will you know that? What do you think? Will you know the loads? Yes. So if we look at this equation, our only unknown is actually going to be that displacement. We can solve it. Now, this is where things get a little bit tricky. A little bit tricky. We are taking the derivative of everything inside. As you can see, we have the derivative outside, so we're taking the derivative of everything inside. 
So what's going to happen is there's going to be certain scenarios where you have to do certain things. What happens if E, A are both a function of X1? Both. Will this get really messy? Yes. In this course, have we ever dealt with E that hasn't been a function or has been a function of X1? No. So if E is constant, can I just take this out? Yes. If A is constant, can I also just take A out? Yes. If A is not constant, we can do product rule, which we're going to see. So in this course, two scenarios. First one, our Young's modulus is constant. We do product rule, we get the following differential equation. This is the one on your assignment this week, or assignment seven. The second one, which is nicer, is if both of these terms are constant, I can factor them both out, so it's just EA times the second derivative of displacement plus P. That's it. So all you guys will need to know in your exams is E constant, perfect, here's my equation. Now wait a second, A is also constant, perfect, here's my equation. Can you solve this very quickly in Mathematica or even by hand for this one? Yeah. So that's all it is. That's beams under axial load. Yes. It's one of those things that I, that's a great question. So let me just, so I put self weight, but the more correct term would be body force. Because even though I derived it horizontally, could I give you this scenario vertically? And then it would have a self weight bringing it down. So typically, if you have a horizontal problem, of course, this is just going to be zero. But I have to put that there in case I do give it to you in a vertical manner. So this thing that we derived, it applies to both horizontal and vertical. If I had, uh, let's just go to the final equations. If I had a vertical scenario instead of x1, I just replace all these terms with x2. And I would solve for the vertical displacement u2. You can use it in either scenario. That's a great question. Any other questions? No? Shall we do some examples, which are very quick? Told you, nice quick lecture. Tell me this, do you guys like it when lectures end early or do you guys just not know what to do with yourselves? Both? Both? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's have some fun. There's only two examples and they're pretty quick. This one right here is more just testing your knowledge. Actually, both of these examples are more just testing your knowledge on the derivations. So it says the shown two-dimensional beam deforms such that vertical lines stay vertical lines and the vertical lines keep their original length. What is that basically telling us? In my assumptions that I listed in my lecture slides, what did I call this assumption? Plane sections remain plane. That's what it means. Plane sections remain plane. It says, well, the new horizontal position is given by x1, which is equal to x1 plus ux1. Is this just what we derived previously? That part right there. Ooh, that looks terrible. I'll erase it in two seconds. Was that what we just derived? Yes. So, so far, so good. And it says, where u1 is a function of x1. It says the center line of the beam deforms according to the function y. So as we can see in this particular case, our beam is going horizontal, but it's also deflecting. What would this be? Would this just be a beam under axial load or would this be a beam column? What do you guys think? Who thinks just beam under axial load? Who thinks beam column? It's beam column. Hold on, Clayton, you didn't teach me beam columns. What am I gonna do? The purpose of this example is to show you guys that now you know how the derivations work. You can solve for anything you want. The question says, what is the small strain matrix as a function of the position of the beam? So that's all we're going to do. We are going to come down here and say, okay, they give us the position function X. It said for x1, it's just going to be x1 plus u1 as a function of x1. 
it says that x2 is going to be x2 plus y as a function of x1. What about x3? What do you think x3 is going to be? My physician function x3. That's that direction into the page. Who has a guess for me? No one? It's just going to be x1 because the displacement will be zero. Basically what this means is we're assuming that the beam doesn't start going in and out of the page. If the beam, if we know the behavior has that in and out of the page, can we model it in 2D? No. Can I model a beam under bending in 2D? Just a regular beam under bending. What do you guys think? If I have a steel beam, I want to find the moment capacity, the stresses, whatever. Can I model it in 2D? Who thinks yes? Yes. yes. If you're concerned about moment capacity. If I were to just put load on a beam, steel beam, straight downwards, is it going to come out of the page? 374 students. Will my beam come at you guys if I just load it vertically? Who thinks no? Who thinks yes? I hear some yeses. Why? Why yes? Exactly. Lateral torsional buckling. If I were to take a beam, put moment, it comes to you. If I want to investigate lateral torsional buckling of a steel beam, can I model it in 2D? No. So this is where you have to start making those assumptions. If you're modeling something in 2D, we know it's just going to be X3. Because what happens is, when I find the displacement functions, U, all I'm doing is subtracting X1, X2, and X3. So we will find that U is just going to be u1 is a function of x1, y is a function of x1, and 0. Have I lost anybody so far? It's not too bad. If I know my displacement functions, can I find my strain tensor? That's what the question wants. Yes. All I need to do is find the displacement gradient first. So we're just going to scroll down a bit, and we are going to find our displacement gradient, nabli u. So we know that nabli u is just going to be a bunch of partial derivatives of our displacement function. So the first row is going to be the derivatives of our displacement function u1 with respect to big X1, big X2, and big X3. So if I wanted the first component, 1, 1, and that right there is my position function, u1 is x1. What's my first component going to be in my displacement gradient? What is the derivative of u1 with respect to x1? Is u1 a function of x1? So do you think it'll be 0? That's the key here. The derivative is just going to be equal to the derivative. That's what I was asking you guys to say. But I know that's a trick question. So we know for the first component, it's going to be the derivative of u1 with respect to x1. The key here is that we know it's a function of x1. If I were to go to the second entry now, the derivative of u1 with respect to x2, what's that going to be? Zero, because it's not a function of x2. So we know in this case, we are going to have zero. And what about the third entry as a function of x3? Or the derivative with respect to x3? Zero. So it's just going to be equal to zero. Now, for the second row, we just do the exact same procedure, but now our position, or sorry, displacement function changes to this. What is going to be my first entry right here? What do you guys think? First entry right here. Yeah, dy dx. We can take the derivative because we know it's a function of x1. So it's going to be equal to, oops, <laughs> that's the wrong one, dy with respect to dx1. What about the other two entries? Zero. 
So we have zero and we have zero. What's my whole full, uh, third line going to be? Zeros. The derivative of zero is just going to be zero. So zero, zero, zero. Is this different so far than what it would be for just a beam under axial load? Yes, it's going to be different. Before we get to the strain tensor, let's ask some fun questions. We know because we derived it for beams under axial load that because of this component, we are going to have epsilon one one. There is going to be a normal strain. But you think that there will be a strain in the vertical direction. We haven't got, we haven't calculated the strain tensor yet. So let's just place your bets. What do you guys think? So am I going to get an epsilon two two? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? Okay, so there's more no's. Who thinks I'm going to get a shearing strain? All right, who thinks yes? I didn't say it though. Okay, who thinks no? Let's find out. So I'm gonna come over here. We know that epsilon small is equal to one half of NABLA U plus NABLA U transpose. So if we were to come down here, actually, uh, yeah, I'll just put it right here. Let's look at the first component. In Nabla U, switch to green, this is our first component. Is this also the first component in Nabla U transpose? That doesn't change. So we're basically taking our derivative, adding it to the same derivative, so we have two times the derivative, and then dividing by two. So is our first entry in our strain tensor just going to be this right here? Yes. We added it to itself to get two times it, and then we divide by two, so it goes back to this original thing right here. So our first entry is going to be the derivative of u1 with respect to x1. Let's go to, let's see if I can put this on screen. Let's go to this entry right here. In NABLU, this entry is zero. But is that entry right here zero in NABLU transpose? No. If I were to transpose this, this pops up to the other side. So we have zero plus this component divided by two. So as we can see, we have one half dy over dx. So there is a shearing strain. Whoever guessed that is right. Is there going to be a strain component over here? Well, no, because we're adding this to this, it's going to be equal to zero. So I'm going to come down, zero. And if we were to carry it through, we can see that this is going to be one half dy over dx1. This will be zero, 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 zero. And then the last thing was, is there going to be a vertical strain? The answer is no. Because now the U, 2, 2 is zero. If I were to transpose it, well, it's still this value, so zero, zero plus zero divided by two, zero. So this would be our tensor right here. Could you guys have derived this? As long as you know if U and Y are a function of could you derive the strain tensors? What do you think? Yes, the only key is knowing what they're a function of. Other than that, you guys will be perfectly fine. We're going to go to the next one. And this is more reminiscent of what you would see on an exam, but it does get a little mean. So it says, the shown actually loaded beam is made of a linear elastic material with a unit area. Well, that's pretty nice, but a varying Young's modulus such that the Young's modulus is 200 minus 20 x1. If the distributed load is equal to zero and the beam is subjected to an end load of P, then determine the differential equation of equilibrium. So in these cases where it's very, very general, the best way to do it is start from the equation we derived. We said that the derivative with respect to x1 of E a 
D1 with respect to X1 plus P is equal to zero. So this is the general equation before we separated it into cases. Now, the question has a couple of nice little tidbits of information. First one, it says that we have a unit area, unit area. So what is my area equal to? Just one. Is that a constant value? So can I take the area outside of my differential? Yes. But for this problem, since it's one, can I just cancel it out? Yeah, it's not going to impact things. We can take it out, of course, but then we're just multiplying things by one, which should be the same. So because of that, I'm just going to say, okay, see you later. The next thing it says, there is no distributed load. If the distributed load is equal to zero, what is P then? What is P? Zero. This goes away. Question says there's no distributed loads. So we basically come down here and we now have this equation. We have the derivative with respect to x1 of e times derivative of u1 with respect to x1 is equal to zero. It's not a bad equation. The thing we have to keep in mind is e a function of x1. If we were to go up here, is e a function of x1? Yes. So can I just take E out without doing anything? No, I have to take the derivatives. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here and say, okay, E is equal to 200 minus 20 X1. I'm going to give you a hint. We're going to need the derivative, but we'll do that after. What do we do in this scenario then? How do we make this equation nicer? Actually, what do you guys want? You want blue? We'll go blue. That looks nice. How do we simplify this? Basically, how do we expand this? Math 100 flashbacks, anyone? Product rule. Basically, what I do is I take the derivative of one term, multiply it by the other, and then I take the derivative of the other term and then multiply it by the other. So if I were to expand it out, the first term will have the derivative of e with respect to x1 and then the second term we just leave alone so du1 with respect to x1 and then we add it to kind of the reverse so now we have e left alone what is the derivative with respect to x1 of the derivative of u1 second derivative that's it so in this case here we'll have the second derivative of u1 now with respect to x1 and this is all equal to zero we know what e is can i find the derivative of e what's the derivative of e going to be equal to what's the derivative of e going to be equal to negative 20 piece of cake negative 20 so all i have to do is just substitute values for the first part, the derivative of e, we know that's negative 20. Then we have the partial derivative of u1 with respect to x1. And then we plus e, which is 200 minus 20 x1 multiplied by the second derivative of u1 with respect to x1. So question for you guys really quick, is my only unknown displacement? Basically, can I solve this equation for displacement? Yes. Is this a linear response if E is a function of x1? It's nothing but what we've quite seen before. It's a function of x1. It's pretty linear. What I'm trying to get at is this. Even if, let's say this was x1 squared, could you still find the derivative? Could you still find this differential equation? So basically, could you have solved a nonlinear problem? Yes. Isn't that nice? 
No? No one cares? <laughs> it's pretty nice. And that's it. Because once you have this, you just throw in some Mathematica. You have the displacement. That's the key here. You can derive basically anything the world has to throw at you. We cover linear elastic materials. It's actually kind of a fun thing in grad school. All the new graduate students, they go to grad school and they expect nonlinear. Do you think nonlinear just comes right off the bat? Linear to nonlinear. How much of grad school, grad school, you know, top of the top, how much of grad school do you think is nonlinear? 20%, 50%, nonlinear. 50%? Who thinks it's a lot? Who thinks it's more nonlinear than linear? Who thinks it's more linear? It's more linear. It's about 90% linear. Because if you know linear, which we've covered this entire course, is it that hard to go to nonlinear? No. And it's not that hard in actual simulation. The thing that starts to become hard in simulation isn't switching to a nonlinear response. It's figuring out when things start to break. That's where things get hard. It's not hard to simulate steel yielding. It's hard to simulate steel fracturing. Same with concrete. It's not hard to get concrete's behavior, which is parabolic. It's hard to get the cracks in the concrete. And those are things that we need. If I can't have my model show the concrete cracks, is it a very good model? Probably not. The reason why is because above this slab is concrete. And what we typically do with concrete slabs is we have this subroof over it. Now, at your homes, you guys all live in homes, at least I'm assuming so. Typically, you guys have gypsum board over top. If my beam were to start cracking, do you think it's also going to make the gypsum crack too? Yes. So it's very important to figure out when things actually do crack because it'll start to make things look bad. If you guys go to NREM, where they have all those concrete beams, and if you go look underneath them, cracks everywhere. Cracks everywhere. What? Concrete cracks. It's kind of a little fun fact. Concrete cracks. There's only one problem with concrete cracking. What do you think it is? We don't rely on concrete for tension, so who cares about the tension? But if concrete were to crack, does it open up? So is there a way for water to get to the steel? And does steel corrode? Oh, that's not a good thing. So that's why we try to limit concrete cracking. It's funny, in the code book, there's also special clauses for visual cracks. If a concrete beam were to have large cracks, even though it's perfectly safe, would you go under it? If you didn't know structural engineering, probably not. Who's been to Toronto? All right, a couple at the back. You guys ever seen that Gardner Bridge? That thing is falling apart. It's a big freeway bridge right down the center of Toronto. You guys watch the Blue Jays game? You see the, the big road right next to the stadium? That's that building. If you go underneath it, there is pieces of concrete literally missing. Missing. You see all the steel. That thing is just an accident waiting to happen. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, so the question is, well, what can we do? Do you think that there's other materials besides steel that we can use for tension? What do you guys think? I'll let you think about it while I answer the question. Yes. What powers is it to solve this? That's a great question. So first of all, let's look at the equation. How many boundary conditions do you think we'll need? Two. The number of boundary conditions goes to the highest order of your differential equation. In this case, the highest order is two. And remember, this is all in terms of displacement. If we were to look up here, what is my displacement on the left? It's fixed. Zero. So this one's easy. So you're thinking, okay, I got displacement at zero equal to zero. That's not a big deal. Do I have a displacement condition on the, the right? No. Do I have a stress condition on the right? Yeah. We know, let's say that, oh, I guess A is just equal to one. I'm gonna come down here and solve it. We know that the stress at L is equal to P divided by A. 
Does everyone agree with that? Perfect. Can I throw this into Mathematica the way it is? This is a great question. I'm glad you answered, asked this. Could I just throw that into Mathematica? No. Nope. If I'm solving in a differential equation for displacement, my boundary conditions need to be in terms of displacement. So I know what the stress is equal to, but can I find my strain from stress? Yes. So we know that stress is actually equal to E times epsilon one one. And do I know a relationship between epsilon one one and displacement? Yes, it was the first derivative. So this is actually equal to E times the first derivative of u1 with respect to x1. So if I were to rearrange this, basically what I can do is I can say that u1 prime at L is going to equal to P divided by EA. And that's all, that would be the second boundary condition. It's funny because as you will see, this is going to appear a lot, EA. In bending, did we have E times something as well? Last lecture, Euler Bernoulli beams, did we have E times something related to the cross section? Moments of inertia. So these are actually very important parameters. If we have EI, we call that the bending stiffness. If we have EA, we call that the axial stiffness. These are all related to stiffness. For those poor souls, still not at the end of 372, do you use axial stiffness a lot to solve for indeterminate members? Yes. You might want to get comfortable with EA. <laughs> Actually, that, general, that formula in general, P over EA, it'll appear a lot in 372. That's how we solve for indeterminate structures. So that's it for the examples. I was asking you guys about something else. Oh, yeah. Is there an alternative to steel? You saying Clayton steel corrodes? Is there something that doesn't corrode? What do you guys think? Is there a building material that doesn't corrode? That plastic. We have something called FRP. It's little fibers, fiber reinforced polymer, FRP, that we could replace steel with. So why do you think we have steel and concrete still? Ooh, I just about went for a ride. What's the benefit of steel? P? MP? MPA? Like the stiffness, 400 MPA? Yeah. The funny thing is, is FRP is much better. What is the yield stress of steel approximately? Pre-5400? FRP is 1,000. And FRP doesn't corrode. So why aren't we using FRP? You guys ever seen FRP tested under tension? Kaboom. When it fails, it explodes. And it's one of those terrible explosions because it literally turns the thing into dust. And you get the dust stuck in your hair all week and it's itchy. It's kind of like having fiberglass every, well, it is fiberglass technically. <laughs> So that's the reason why. In design, we don't just design for strength, we have to design to make sure that if something does fail, it gives warning time. Steel is ductile. It'll provide a lot of warning time for us to get out. FRP, <laughs> boom. Last thing you hear, you won't see anything else ever again. So that's why we don't use FRP, but it's becoming more and more uh, prevalent in bridge design, because bridges, of course, have a big problem with corrosion. So yeah, that's it for today's uh, lecture. Any questions about the midterm before I let you guys go? Midterm's on Thursday, remember. Yes, oh, thank you. So my review session today is going to be at six o'clock. I realize that five o'clock isn't always the best because you guys are just coming home from university. So the review session tonight is five o'clock. I'll send an email, right, six o'clock. I'll send an email out later. All right. If there's no questions, have a wonderful day and a wonderful reading week.